Hi, Claire. Hi. Welcome to Voices of Innovation. Excited to be here. Saw you yesterday, but excited for this deeper dive. That's great. And, and thanks so much for joining us. We were just reflecting before we went on air that, you know, two years ago at, at this event, you were the voice of what was very innovative at that moment, because you were explaining on stages, not only here, but all over the world, what was generative AI? And here we are literally two years later, and my sense is that you are now the voice of innovation of something significantly different. Voices of Innovation invites big thinkers with bold ideas who are here at the ASU GSV Summit to talk about the influence of technology in today's society and our future of education. I'm your host, Lev Gonick from Arizona State University. Let's jump in. Yeah, um, a lot has evolved and, and you are so kind. I, I feel like I was just sharing with the education space what we were seeing in the tech world, which was, you know, a massive generational discovery coming and that technology has obviously massively evolved. Uh, I think since then, you know, two years ago, I think it was the big ChatGPT moment. So it was just getting everybody with their arms around this concept of, you know, these units of intelligence, this access to infinite intelligence 24 um, seven, and the models have only gotten better. I feel like the two big things for me I've seen over the last two years probably advance way more than I, I could have expected or one, just advancements around multimodality. It felt like last year there were huge, huge pushes in video and voice. And then I think this year we're really seeing that all combined, that combination of multi multimodality plus the actual existing uh, pushes that we've gotten in capabilities. And now all that combined plus reasoning equals potentially a very big push towards agents, which it we'll, feels which like- we'll, Which we'll get into. Yeah. And we, we definitely want to sort of so, I mean, I think that that is an interesting yeah. sort of way of describing the path that we've all been on. And if you, just before we kind of go deeper on that, you know, just a personal reflection here, because I think two years ago, as I say, I, I genuinely do believe that you were the voice all across, you know, the landscape. And certainly we invited you to Arizona State University to help us understand, you know, two years ago, kind of how this landscape and the light bulbs were going off. And, you know, I think if I'm not mistaken, this actually set you on a new professional, uh, you know, trajectory because although you were associated with GSV, um, it became a real thing and someone needed to lead the GSV portfolio when it came to the opportunity to look at investments and uh, basically being able to really describe the landscape. Just reflect for a moment on your own personal yeah. you know, moment, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, I mean, I had always been interested in the AI space and had been tracking things like GBT2 and, and uh, GBT3 being rolled out. But I think with the big chat GBT moment, it was a big aha that this is going to permeate everything. Um, it's not just, you know, big AI labs pushing out research. Now we're actually going to see that move downstream into the application layer. Um, with that, it meant that we're, we were starting to see a lot of tooling um, it felt like a lot of the early companies that we saw were, uh, in many ways, wrappers around the existing uh, models that that uh, were being pushed out by these AI labs. And so with that, I think our our team believed that there was going to be a big push. It was kind of the golden opportunity mm -hmm. for startups to build now, because now that you have all the big companies, you know, pushing on the, the infrastructure front. Um, hopefully with, as we knew that token cost would go down and cost of building would go down, um, this would just make building with AI that much more accessible. And so we did see that come true. Uh, and what's interesting is, you know, when I first started out, there was a small crop of AI ed tech startups. That was in a category. And I, I think I remember I even two years ago made a market map of AI and ed tech startups. And now obviously every company is an AI education company. <laughs> You know, your newsletter uh, that started about two and a half years ago, uh, you know, was was always essentially the intelligence source for what was going on. But I haven't, you know, this is more of an editorial question yeah. to you. What's your sense of kind of what has uh, evolved over the first couple of years with respect to investor enthusiasm or investor positioning vis-a-vis -vis ed tech in particular? Yeah, I think always remembering that we're still very much so in the early innings of this AI revolution. Uh, if you look at the broader venture capital space, I think almost half of funding last year went into AI startups. Uh, that being said, a lot of the capital has gone into infrastructure related startups. So it, it's clear that they're building up the support and laying the groundwork for a lot of the applications. 
Um, I do think there's a lot of excitement around AI and education specifically. That's why you have the biggest AI labs starting education arms. Um, you know, they haven't started other vertical arms yet. Education is one of the biggest use cases of um, all these big AI labs and chatbots learning, uh, finding information. And so it's clear that people see this promise and vision for a ambient 24-7 AI tutor that can live in your pocket, expanding access to knowledge. I think people are excited about the bet on that vision. That being said, I think, as I mentioned early on, we saw a lot of, I think, a, a question around, are we investing right now in tools versus platforms right. that can exist standalone? There's always kind of this David versus Goliath tension with, we saw a bunch of startups that started with AI grading, AI feedback generation, uh, AI lesson plan generator. And these were all really great. And at the time we were like, wow, that, you know, you weren't able to do this at scale, at low cost with AI prior. Right. Uh, but then you quickly saw that become absorbed and as those became features that were eventually commoditized and became part of many, many platforms. So for us, um, it's always that differentiation and tension between do we believe that you can build a business around this and build a platform versus currently, you know, it is so easy to stand up a tool, which is very exciting for builders. But at the same time, if we're investing in hopefully very large businesses with a ton of upside, then we need to identify those that are really going to build a brand, a core business that has many elements of AI and is able to monetize on that. It's my observation, again, push back if it's not if it's not even close, is that as much as anything else, you're looking to the serial entrepreneurs who are mm -hmm. coming back into the ed tech space and kind of going, we're going to put a bet on you. We may not yet have the full bet on what the technology is going to actually eventually evolve into as a mature offering, whether it is infrastructure applications or services. And what we really want to do is just get a bunch of thoroughbreds, you know, in our stable who are going to be able to position us to make sure that our investments, you know, have have uh, fidelity because you know, you're you all thoroughbreds. Is, yeah. is that a boat, right? You are absolutely spot on. I mean, we typically come in seed series A. So these are very, very early. A lot of time, it is all about the people in the product, if not more of the people in an AI era. A lot of what we're betting on is that they, we know that the tech is going to change on a weekly basis. And so, so much of the bet is on that team and their ability to not only execute in the AI era and ship quickly, but also very quickly adapt when multimodal becomes available and be able to you know skate to where the puck is heading and and not necessarily be stuck with building with the technology of today but building for the technology of five ten years out and my sense is again I mean, here at the asu gsv summit uh, and obviously uh in the couple of days before the summit over uh at the ai show that there are really talented humans mm -hmm. who are, you know, some of them, of course, very enthusiastic about the spot solution they have today, but actually very thoughtful that, in fact, if there's not so much a long run, but a sort of a short to medium run, that, that they're going to be positioned uh, to continue to evolve with the technology. And, um, you know, my sense is that that probably is a pretty good strategy. Again, as a buyer of, of technology, the truth is looking at who's in charge is probably every bit as important. In fact, arguably more important at this moment, just in terms of where ASU, for example, might make a commitment to testing any of these technologies. It's kind of the those who are tried and true and who've done this before. It's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. It's also interesting, I think, even on enterprise and, you know, for any buyers, I think at least what we're also seeing from a lot of the, the founders we're backing is that there is a lot of, I mean, what they're calling chicken nugget revenue, a lot mm -hmm. of just trying and testing things out. And so it's trying to find the founders who can break past just pilots and, and you know, uh, the buyers test, testing and just dipping their toes in the water to actually renew contracts and convert into long-term partnerships. You know, uh, you, you know, you tracked and ASU experienced, you know, that that immediate enthusiasm of, uh, you know, the notebook LM and all of a sudden light bulbs are going off. Oh, that is what multimodal actually looks like. It's synthesizing data, but it's actually creating a podcast. And it was kind of novel at the moment. You mentioned earlier on that, you know, video has you know, become part of, you know, the multimodal experience in education. Where are you seeing sort of multimodal products beginning to find market interest. And let me just say, you know, please also add, where are your investors seeing interest in the multimodal as well? Yeah, I think voice is having a ton of momentum. I think, you know, a lot of the bet on voice is that for the longest time, our ways of interacting with computers has largely been in the form of clicks, typing, uh, text. And so 
the ability to now use natural language to talk to machines is is very novel and translate those audio commands into actions or text is is very new. And so I think being able to do that, you know, we we looked at a company that was taking in classroom audio and able to turn that classroom audio and automatically help teachers uh, take attendance, automatically help them draft up communications for after they're, they, they've run that class. Um, at the same time, you know, there's also other modalities. So a lot of interesting companies, especially in the K-12 and, and higher ed world, um, when you're dealing with STEM content, the ability to now actually use AI to analyze uh, handwritten work. And as people are working through and solving math problems, uh, the ability for AI to sit ambiently and identify misconceptions as you're working through a problem in real time, that is a massive leap unlocked by multimodality versus I think if you look two, three years ago, that, you know, we our way of assessing kids were multi multiple choice questions. Right. And so that big unlock that you see from having the ability to process text, image, video, uh, all at the same time allows you to have these new forms of assessment even. ASU's president Michael Crow is going to be on stage with Black Eyed Peas, Will yeah. I Am. And we're actually going to announce a multimodal uh partnership with uh Will's company fyi.ai yeah uh, and it will be pervasively available at asu because it actually is all premised on exactly what you just finished saying about the, the ability to put an audio experience uh, in the hands of students with personas associated with their learning journeys and uh, and related experiences whether it's formal learning or informal so I, I think you know a university like ASU is ready at this point to make some investments in, in that play, and I think it speaks to the mainstreaming of the multimodal part uh, of AI. So that that should be kind of fun. I want to absolutely hear your sense of kind of where we're going with respect to Agentic, and what are you seeing that's interesting, and what do you see that maybe cast a little bit of insight as to kind of where you see there's more hype than there is, or you know more smoke than signal, if you will, uh, at this moment. But focus on the signal. Where are you seeing opportunities? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, one thing to also remember is I think the industry is very torn on how to define what these agents are. I largely view it as this push towards AI systems that are not only helping us assist and giving us outputs of information in the form of, say, something like a ChatGPT or Claude, but actually helping us do for the first time. So helping us actually execute entire workflows end to end. And, and that's the agentic behavior I think people are talking about. I think in terms of signal, uh, you know, a lot of hype around computer use, this ability for for the first time ever, AI can actually navigate the web for you. Um, what that means for, you know, unlocking workflows is going to be huge. You don't have to have a human sit next to a computer and prompt, receive an answer prompt. Um, so I think signal wise, that's kind of where a lot of people are focusing their attention on. Uh, I think a lot of people are starting this, to think about this concept of selling work. Right. Um, so we're no longer selling software assistance. We're actually potentially biting into labor budgets and actually selling work as a software, right. uh, work as a service. So actually so the, the digital worker joining in the overall calculation of the investment in, in labor. Exactly. And I think someone flipped it on, a, on, on its head and that instead of a software as a service, it's actually now service as a software. Yeah. And I think that this is, you know, one of the more provocative and my sense is, you know, we'll probably need to see uh, you know, investment uh, follow, uh, people follow ideas like that. Right. Um, but I think there is no uh, no one that I know who's at least not curious uh, about this because we're in a certain moment in time. And certainly at ASU, we're being driven by the fact that it's growth challenge for part of our overall strategy is to figure out how to get digital workforce part of our overall uh, workforce. Claire, we're almost out of time. But I, in this Voices of Innovators, Innovation a series, I've always been asking the same last question to folks. And, you know, you've been on this journey at ASU GSV so, from as long as, um, help me, how long have you actually been? Uh, in, five years. I'm going to say, yeah. I, was, I thought it was pre-COVID, so I wasn't 100% mm -hmm. sure. But, you know, again, as the voice and amplifier of all things AI in the ed tech sector, when we get together again next year at ASU GSV here in San Diego, what will be sort of your sense of the marker of what you think we should be anticipating in terms of the maturity or the changes that are going to happen in the market over the next 12 months? 
Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I guess maybe jumping back into the the agents world. I think right now we haven't delivered on that. I don't see many, I mean, even companies at this event, which is one of the most future facing events. You, I don't think agents are being deployed widespread. They're still very much so in pilot testing mode, experiment mode. Uh, right now, we don't trust agents to execute um, on our behalf for full workflows. And we can't necessarily walk away for full hours and let them run three, run free. Um, so I think maybe next year we'll hopefully, you know, as reasoning gets better, uh, these things get much more accurate. And, you know, I think we're also blending in this idea of memory as well, when mm -hmm. they start to remember how you like to do things. Assistance you're in your yeah. sense. Yeah. So it's not only agents that are able to do things, but also now you're adding this element of agents that are remember that are able to remember how Lev likes to do things versus how Claire likes to do things. Right. I think when we see that, um, potentially, ho hopefully next year at, at the pace that we're moving. Right. Claire Zhao, GSV, thanks so much for Thank everything you. you do and for joining us on Thank Voices of Innovation. Thank you so much. All right.